I was browsing through LinkedIn and I saw you comment on, <laughs> on Banner Boy's picture with Africa on steroids. <laughs> Is your work centered, you know, on the continent rather than, you know, uh, the diaspora? Maybe- Why we centered our work on Africa? And I mean, I should say this from the onset, the Africa Oxford Initiative was really about re- not about global citizenship or giving back to Africa or supporting Africa or any of that yeah. stuff. Yes, it was yes. from the recognition, the very real recognition that the future of the world, the past, the present and the future of the world is mm-hmm. intricately linked to what happens mm-hmm. in the past. And exactly. any organization in the 21st century has to have a deliberate and very different uh, strategy for engaging with the continent mm-hmm. if we are all to see a, a, a global prosperous future. So it mm-hmm. came from the recognition that the future of the continent will determine the future of the world. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to My Science Journey. This time uh, we are featuring Dr. Anne McKenna, a phenomenal woman that I personally look up to. Uh, she is the co-director of the Africa Oxford Initiative. I think most of you are sort of like familiar with AFOX. AFOX is a vibrant platform for all things Africa in Oxford. Uh, and the vision for AFOX is to make Africa a strategic priority for the University of Oxford by facilitating equitable, sustainable, and impactful collaborations between Oxford and African institutions. Um, AFOX program include a bespoke uh, graduate scholarship program, so probably some of you are familiar with this. Um, And there's also the research and academic mobility programs, as well as innovation platform for African entrepreneurs. Um, Dr. McKenna is responsible for developing and implementing the overall strategy for AFOX, uh, and this is through fundraising and stakeholder engagement, as well as just supporting the delivery of the core AFOX programs. She has a DPhil in chemical biology, <laughs> so uh, we'll speak about that in a few, uh, from Oxford, and as well as an executive MBA uh, from the uh, Said Business School in Oxford here as well. Uh, we are so glad to have you, Dr. McKenna. Thank you so much for honoring our invite. Um, yeah, we are so happy uh, with all the work that you're doing with our folks and everything that you're doing for the continent. So yeah, just to kickstart this conversation, you know, um, a few people will be wondering, <laughs> you know, how did you get to, you know, uh, start uh, the Africa Oxford Initiative? How did you move from, you know, a DPhil in chemical biology to now doing something totally different uh, with our folks? Can you please, you know, give us a brief overview of that? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me on, Ruth. It's an incredible privilege to be here. I'm a little Ruth fan girl, so this is an honor for me to be on your my science journey. And uh, to answer your question, I mean, first let me, you know, be grateful for the wonderful introduction that you've you've given me. It's often weird when someone says your story, you're standing back and going, "Are they still talking about me?" <laughs> you know. So thank you for the very generous um, introduction. So. To answer your question, I mean, my journey is not um, very typical in that I've gotten a few detours along the way, but I think there's a thread that that connects all of those. And my my inclination to switch from active, you know, in the lab kind of research, because I don't think I've really left science or left, you know, academia for that matter. But my decision to switch from basic science research was really grounded on the work that I had done for many years pre Uh, joining Oxford, which was around community organizing, thinking about community mobilization and supporting transformative projects uh, for individuals and for communities. So my background really, I started out as as young as maybe 15 in community, local community NGOs, working on HIV and uh, child health uh, mobilization projects. Uh, in at the time, I thought I was going to be a doctor, like every decent, you know, African child in school. <laughs> you have very yeah, few options. Yeah. Um, but I very quickly realized that I do not like the sight of body fluids. Um, so I decided to try in pharmacy. So that became yeah. my obsession. I wanted to be a pharmacist. I wanted to be close to patients, but not really in the hospital room. Um, but at some point in the transition, I think biochemistry became the more obvious pathway for me because I enjoyed the science. Instead of dispensing the drugs, I was more interested in how do these things come together. I was very fortunate to work in a hospital that had a a small local clinic 
uh, before I joined undergraduate and and the, the sense that we were just dishing out drugs was you know weird for me and so I was yeah. more interested in why do we give this particular drugs for this particular conditions what do they do what are the impacts and and during that conversation the lady who gave me that first job uh, God rest her soul Piera I said you can go to university and learn biochemistry then you will know why we give this drug I'm like, okay mm-hmm. I'm gonna go try it I didn't know the first thing about it science yeah. made sense I did very well in science so I, it was the most natural next step for me and I I was very fortunate to have really great mentors in biochemistry and more university where I studied and so coming to Oxford I followed the same thing because it just made sense but I knew deep down that I was always interested more in what does this mean for my family back in yeah, you know, yeah, northern, yeah. northern Kenya? What does this mean for the everyday person? And the realization towards the end of my detail, like anybody who comes to the end of their detail and are feeling very jaded, what's the point of all of this? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and in that conversation, I think the question for me was. We have huge challenges. I work on diagnostics for antimicrobial resistance um, and developing new interventions, uh, new uh, chemical um, interventions for managing uh, infections that are resistant to existing antimicrobials. And I think for me, it was obvious that you needed more than one person working on this. You needed a whole legion of people working in different sectors. And so the idea of AFOX was seeded from that. And I could talk a lot more about how the conversation began with with my colleague, Kevin, and so forth. But really, it stems from that deep, how would I say that, the deep, um, the deep-seated need to see that my work whatever I do counts for something for, for yeah. my communities, however I choose to define them. Okay, so it's it's an act of sort of like giving back to the community and, you know, involving different people um, from where you're stemming from or, you know? I don't even think I can call it giving back because mm-hmm. giving back assumes that I have built all of this and now I am yeah. giving it to some. I haven't. I haven't. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I think about it as giving front, you know, giving forwards mm-hmm. rather mm-hmm. than giving back. Mm-hmm. It's giving forwards. Mm-hmm. It's recognizing that mm-hmm. the work that needs to be done um, yeah. re- requires multiple people and I am not an expert in multiple things. Mm-hmm. But I, what I can do very well is create opportunities for the people who are doing the work to be able to prosper and thrive while they're doing it, right? So for me, I don't consider any work that I do sort of giving back. It's giving, giving back, forwards. Yeah. It's giving oh, forwards. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally it's, it's makes sense. Yeah, it makes it makes it makes it it makes it easy for me to not think of myself as a benevolent, you know, mm-hmm. person who's giving back to the community. I'm like, I, I don't think of myself <laughs> in that way at all. <laughs> at okay, all. No. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I, right. I think I have opportunities that I mm-hmm. have access to, and there are people yeah. who are, you know, really well deserving and should have access to those opportunities. And the challenges that we face in the continent require everybody to get involved in in, in solving those challenges. Uh, okay, so um, mm-hmm. you know there is a, a number of Africans in the diaspora, right? But why why is your work centered, you know, on the continent rather than you know uh, the diaspora maybe can you speak to us about that as well so i, I think we define africa very bro- broadly so i think mm-hmm. of global africa and people of african descent wherever they are the reason mm-hmm. why we centered our work on africa and i mean i should say this from the onset the africa oxford initiative was really about re- not good global citizenship or mm-hmm. giving back to africa or supporting africa or any of that yeah. stuff Yes, it was yes. from the recognition, the very real recognition that the future mm-hmm. of the world, the past, the present, and the future of the world is mm-hmm. intricately linked to what happens mm-hmm. in the continent. And exactly. any organization in the 21st century has to have a deliberate and very different uh, strategy for engaging with the continent mm-hmm. if we are all to see a, a, a global prosperous future. So it mm-hmm. came from the recognition of the, the future of the continent will determine the future of the world. Yeah. From both what we are seeing in the social economic um, dem- changes happening in the continent and the demographic changes we are seeing in Africa, we know that you know we, 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 you've had it all over. You know that 2.5 yeah. billion people yeah. will yeah. be living in the continent by 2050, yeah. um, and we know that the the continent together, although diverse as we are, 
um, different as we are, as both within countries and broader than that, uh, the, the continent's heads of states have signed up to this Agenda 2063, which is a blueprint mm -hmm. for building our economies based on, you know, knowledge-based economies for Africa's development. And for us, our role in that, our very small role in that is supporting the work that's already going on in the continent and mm -hmm. by people of African descent, wherever they are, to yeah. advance those knowledge-based economies. Um, so we focus on the continent and it's very deliberate, even our own naming. Those who are in Oxford know that everything yeah. is Oxford this, <laughs> Oxford that, Oxford that. Yeah. Um, but we are very deliberately Africa, Oxford to center um, yeah. African, African knowledge, African experience, African people um, yeah. in our conversations about the future of the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I love that you brought, you know, that view, you know, about, you know, Africa and, you know, why it's central. And I think it's important for people to, you know, um, to learn and to recognize the fundamental aspect that Africa plays, um, you know, as being the center of, you know, everything that would happen in the world. And, mm -hmm. you know, yesterday I was I was browsing through LinkedIn and I saw you comment on, <laughs> on Banner Boy's picture with Africa on steroids. <laughs> And I just want to, you know, <laughs> bring that in uh, in this conversation as well, and to just, mm -hmm. you know, uh, speak about that that aspect as well with re uh, relating it to the work that you do at Afox. Well, okay, I didn't expect Banaboy would come up in the <laughs> my science journey, but here we are. <laughs> Even my son absolutely loves Banaboy, and he's been born and brought up in 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 the UK, right? A yeah. few, you know, decades ago, that wouldn't have been a thing, right? Somebody yeah. who was yeah. born and bred here, seeing and taking so much pride in an African artist. And he is obsessed, like he absolutely loves um, Afrobeat and all of it. I, I could say that he gets some of it from his mama, but um, those are secrets that we're not going to reveal here. <laughs> Uh, okay. But really, it's, okay. it's that recognition that we live in a really interconnected world. Um, yeah. And I look at, yeah, Banner Boy is one example, but I also yeah. look at our scholars. I look at our yeah. fellows. I yeah. see the work that they do, working on energy yeah. access that is being translated into solutions for the UK energy, yeah. energy challenges. I see the work that you do and seeing it's changing, uh, you know, how we approach management of diseases. For the research fellows that I work with, it's incredible. We see some of them developing programs for how we interpret, you know, neural yeah. images, for instance, using when yeah. in, in lower resource settings. And they bring that information and say, look, this is how we've used algorithms and so forth to be able to understand, uh, you know, what we what we are seeing from neural imaging uh, yeah. uh, from our, within the resource constraints that we have. And that work being taken up as uh, with, by NHS as a way of managing costs, right? So whatever is happening in the continent is not just for Africa. Yes. You know, yes. be it research, yes. be it science. Yes. Whatever yes. we are producing is actually really changing the world. And, and I think yeah. we need to take yeah. pride in that, both musically and Nollywood and, yeah. you know, yeah. all of that, but also through our scientific yeah. contributions and our yeah. knowledge contributions yeah. to the world. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much for sharing that. I just want to change the conversation a bit and just go back, you know, to your primary role at AFOX. Maybe can yeah. you take us through, you know, a typical, a typical day for Anne uh, as AFOX co-director? <laughs> There's no such a thing as a typical day. Um, so this wow. morning I've had four conversations just this okay. morning before 1, 1 a.m. The yeah. first one was about, um, you know, climate risk financing and how we yeah. can support bringing African voices into how we understand uh, risk uh, in climate. And then the second conversation was about the, you know, genomic biobanks and how we yeah. can collaborate with uh, AWS to help us with compute power to uh, uh, access and um, sort of analyze our biobanks. And then the third conversation yeah. <laughs> was about the humanitarian crisis in Sudan and how we can, wow. you know, provide better uh, structured support for our scholars, but researchers as well, the research community that we very closely are aligned with. So there's no such a thing being as a typical yeah. day yeah. but I like yeah. to think of myself in Afox as a CFO yeah uh, not CFO as you understand it I think I call it the chief failure officer <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. and because because I think uh, we've been given a lot of opportunities and we've been really supported by people yeah. across the world 
And, and what I hope we can do is create a platform for experimenting, seeing what does equitable access for, mm -hmm. you know, research funding look like. Let's try a couple of models, see what works, what fails and so forth. Let's learn. Let's create yeah. frameworks that can then be interpreted by other parts of the world and be yeah. used in whatever shape or form. That's why I call myself yeah. a CFO. Mm -hmm. Let's see what does thriving for an African graduate at an institution like Oxford look like? Mm -hmm. Is it funding? Is it support? Is it buddies? Is it what? We'll try a couple of things. We'll see mm -hmm. what works. We'll co-create this with mm -hmm. our students, with our researchers. We'll fail a lot, but we will learn yeah. along the way. And whatever yeah. we build together yeah. can then be tried. And, and you can see that when we set up our folks a few yeah. years later, we supported our colleagues to set up Indox, which is the India Oxford. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now looking to set up other, other jurisdictions, wow. Latin America, the Caribbean, you know, and, and so forth. So the hope is that by creating a space where we can experiment, we can hold each other to account, but we also have the both how do I, institutional courage mm -hmm. to try things that we haven't tried before. At the mm -hmm. same time, institutional humility to yeah. acknowledge where we um, kind of are not doing things right and how we can yeah. improve and so forth. Yeah. And so that that's I think how I see my sort of role. Uh, it within our folks, yeah. but for for the more traditional people, I think I would say I'm <laughs> co-founder and co-director of our folks. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, that sounds great. Um, and speaking about you know things that are not working out well, maybe you can highlight a few challenges that you faced, particularly in promoting you know academic and research collaboration between Oxford and Africa, and you know how you've navigated through some of those. Um, just you know for the sake of someone else that would be thinking of you know doing something like this in future or even now? Um, it's usually difficult to think about challenges because when you're yeah. in it, you're just in it. You know, you just yeah. keep powering through, powering through. And mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest challenges that I am at least navigating now is pause and reflect, you know, stopping mm -hmm. and saying, why is it working? Why is it not working? We're very quick to keep doing things the same way because if it works the first time, we think it will work tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And I think the biggest challenge when you're building anything, and uh, we've been in building mode, we were in stealth mode for maybe three years since we started 2015, 2016, 17, we're sort of in stealth mode. And then we got into active, you know, getting bigger and bigger programs from maybe 2017, 2018. And then after that, it's just scaling from basically 2021, thereabouts, just scaling. And you've been just building and building and building. You don't have a lot of time to pause and reflect mm. and ask a really difficult question. What is working? Why is it working? What's not working? Why is it not working? And so forth. And I think for me, if I was to go through it all over again, I would be more deliberate in creating spaces for pausing and reflecting. Mm -hmm. We've been very fortunate that we've got a very supportive board and that yeah. give us new ideas, fresh ideas yeah. and so forth. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I think it would be really, really important to, to create that. If you're building anything, be very deliberate about mm -hmm. the time that you embed within your day, within your month, within mm -hmm. your year for pausing and reflecting. And mm -hmm. I think the other challenge is um, there's always resource constraint. Uh, mm -hmm. constraints um so be it funding be it people be it you know um ideas whatever but building with enough redundancy within your project that you can be able to manage when resources go dry I mean, all of us know um mm -hmm. during COVID, during covid funding for anything that wasn't essential basically got cut and we got yeah. hit really yeah. hard we got really yeah. hard because like, some of the government funding that we relied on you know basically dried up and but what that allowed us to do is is look for new sources, think about you know more creative ways of sustaining our programs. And I'm very exactly. very honored that we can yeah. we're still standing despite that huge huge you know block along the yeah. way. Um, yeah. Oh, amazing, amazing. And speaking about sustainability, you know, um, what do you think, you know, uh, is your vision for the future of AFOX and you know its role in the future in in fostering sustainable development in Africa? You know, the best thing about my job is that uh, yeah. I, don't, I, I don't have to come up with plans, right? <laughs> I don't have to come with big, lofty ideas. Yes, mm -hmm. I do need to think about the sustainability of the organization and, and the team and so forth. Mm -hmm. But a lot of what happens in Afox is really grown from within the network. We're a massive yeah. network, about 3,000 people. At the moment, we have over 
Oof, at the moment, our scholarships are about 300 scholars. They're going to be very mm-hmm. soon over 500 scholars. Mm-hmm. And that's the community that decides what our folks becomes for them. And yeah. before yeah. we then set up, we had about um, nine to 12 months of conversation with African researchers, with colleagues across departments, with people in African Union, Africa CDC, and so forth, yeah. to just really think, what does Afox look like? What will it be mm-hmm. for you? And what programs would you like to see it happen? What part of the, you know, the big thing would you like to hold and run with? And because of that, we were able to set up something with our colleagues and building on that sort of grassroots movement approach, the thing just runs because people buy it, buy into it and run it the way they would want to. And it's the same thing, I think, for the future. When I think about the future of our folks, it's grown beyond my wildest imagination. It was yeah. supposed to be a nice two-year project, you know, two-year project at the end of my day field for fun. Yeah. And then I'll go get a go get a real job. You know, I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Many years later. So I think yeah. our folks will grow in the same way. I think as yeah. we get to our eighth year now, soon going yeah. to be 10 year anniversary. It's yeah. just that reconnecting with our community, reconnecting with our academic and research and innovation communities and our scholars and saying, what would this thing look like for you for mm. the next decade? And I think the process has already begun. We're already having yeah. you know, those conversations. You're a part of some of those conversations yeah. with our scholars. Yeah. Um, and the hope is that the strategy for our folks will continue to emerge and it will yeah. be an adaptive one and an emerging one as we go, as we go along. And, and one really important element of that is that it works both ways, right? It grows because of the people that support it and are yeah. committed to its success. And it shrivels when people stop, you know, finding value um, mm-hmm. and, and finding, you know, the right things that they are looking for. Uh, and, and I think in that mark, in, in that way, uh, I can't speak for what I hope to see our folks become, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's a lot more powerful when people speak mm-hmm. for what they hope um, to build our yeah. folks to be. Mm-hmm.